Welcome back to Secrets to Success. I'm Crystal, and today's special guest is Theresa Go. Theresa is Singapore's first female and four time Paralympic swimmer, having competed in the Athens, Beijing, London, and Rio Paralympic Games. She clinched a bronze medal at the Rio Paralympic Games and 30 gold medals at the ASEAN Para Games since 2001. So, Theresa, we are so honored to have you join us today and to share your swimming career and journey with us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so maybe, you know, you want to start with uh, your journey. Uh, mm -hmm. Where did your passion for swimming come from? How did you first uh, get into swimming, you know? Um, and at what point did you decide that, okay, I'm going to make this my career? Mm -hmm. Honestly, it never, it didn't really become something that I consciously chose as a career. Mm -hmm. uh, until much, much later. It started out as a rehab thing, you know, um, so, I mean, a bit of background, in case people didn't know. I have spinal bifida, which uh, mm. means that the, I mean, very simply, the spine, spinal cord is affected and I can't use my lower limbs. And so I, I, I use a wheelchair pretty much daily. La. Um, I have a home chair and an outdoor chair so that the, ho the house doesn't get dirty. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the, the, my wheelchair is how I, I move around, la, basically. Um, mm. And so as a, as a child with, as a baby, as a child with disability, I think my parents definitely had, um, were very proactive in making sure that I was active and healthy and, you know, things like that. So I think we, um, they, they, I mean, we tried to do, tried to put me in different spots and in the end, I, I think swimming was just the most natural because it was something that we did as a family. Um, oh, okay. You know, I mean, pretty much every Singaporean family will would have gone to the pool. I think like it's a common pastime. You know, um, yeah. yeah, and I think we were no different, lah. You know, every weekend was spent at the pool, um, and it's for me personally, uh, somewhere that I feel the most free in, um, like it's I can go anywhere in the pool. You know, it's like um, top to bottom, left to right. Like I, I have. Yeah no issues getting anywhere in the water. Um, yeah. I think that's not something that I feel I can do. I can, it's not something I commonly feel, like, especially uh, when, you, when, when navigating like a physical realm, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, but I think for me, it was, it was natural. Uh, and, and that's not to say I didn't try other sports. I tried, uh, I tried so many different sports, like pretty much anything that I could get my hands on. Okay, what on. other sports did you try? Um, wheelchair racing, wheelchair tennis, oh, wow. basketball. Uh, nice. I tried wheelchair rugby in the past five years, six years. Yeah. Uh, sailing, horseback riding. Um, <laughs> I can't. Well, you're really, like, really the athlete. <laughs> try everything just so you know what fits, uh, You know, yeah. so um, I, I mean, in the end, I just settled on swimming just because it was just the most natural fit for me, and I, I really mm. love being in the water. You know, but I think that was the the start of it. It was uh something that. I um I felt comfortable in but then I still didn't know that I really enjoyed it, you know. Uh yeah. I I think it was it was it grew on me, lah, you know. Uh mm. I, So what what did taking part in the Paralympics mean to you? Um it's it's the one place I feel like I feel like part of the majority, you know? Like mm. if you if you if if you ask me how I feel like daily life, it's not I, I don't feel like, I mean, I feel definitely feel like a minority. <laughs> um, I don't see that many, like, it's not like everywhere I turn is someone who I can kind of instantly relate to. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, the Paralympic Games was, the first time I went, it was really an eye-opener. Um, I'd never seen so many disabled people in my life. Uh, <laughs> and everywhere I turned was, like, someone that was on a wheelchair or using a mobility aid or, you know, something like that. And they were all athletes or, like, yeah. Um, staff members, you know, and, and it was it was something like I I truly felt like I belonged, la, you know, mm. um, and it made me feel like I wanted to come back. It's a a great opportunity to really showcase the uh, athletic prowess, uh, you know, of uh, disabled people, and and I think it's really a, a great opportunity to show how much the mind can how, how strong the mind is because yeah. you I mean even even if you talk about Olympic athletes like it's it, it comes down to the mind you know in the end because you can only train your body to a certain extent and then um, after that it's about your mental strength and how yeah. how much you 
you can take it lah. How far can you take it? Yeah. So how did you in the lead up to the Paralympic Games? How did you train your mind? Did you have a sports? I don't know. Psychologist coach. I know all these athletes um, have psychologist coaches that actually help train their mind and their mental strength. Yeah, we we usually have a team. Like I think it's quite um common to have a team of people with you. Um, yeah. and I remember Beijing was pretty like uh, the proportion is not that equal lah. So that's like in in Beijing it was Ping Xiu and I, uh, mm. and there was a huge bunch of people behind us, you know, pushing us and. Not just physically, but uh, not not just literally pushing us, lah. You know, um, and I think, yes, I definitely have great friends who always support <laughs> me. <laughs> I Shout have out to your friend Amanda. Family. Yeah, national swimmer Amanda Lim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's 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 the people who are behind you that really help to yeah. push you to greater heights. You know, um. Yeah. I think in terms of a, like any exercises, do athletes like yourself, yeah, 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 you know, undergo any sure. mental exercises to um, kind of sharpen your? I mean, it's 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 different for each athlete. I think. Um, mm. So we have, I was saying the team. So we have sports trainers. Uh, we have yeah. the gym coaches, S and C coaches. We have the swim coaches. We have the physiotherapists, physiologists, biomechanics, and sports therapists, uh, sports psychologists. We have the nutritionists. You know, like all these different wow, people have their really a whole team. <laughs> Yeah, we have we, like they all have their roles, and they we have our roles. You know, we trust yeah. them, we trust each other, and then I think the analogy that I use is like we are like F one cars, and the team behind us they have they are very specific in what they're supposed to do, and we just yeah. have to go fast. So they they take care <laughs> yeah. of all the different parts, right? Like if if you are the F one car, the athlete, then they take, <laughs> somebody takes care of the wheels, someone takes care of the engine, and then everybody has to come together to yeah yeah make the and, race and we all work together and if one part doesn't work it it doesn't work you know yeah. um and it's really and, and yeah it's a, it's a really t- huge team effort and then even mm-hmm. when you're not working at the pool or your or your training ground like back home like at home my my mom my dad you know my family members yeah. they all i mean they all emotionally support me my mom cooks uh pretty healthy meals you know my dad he used to drive me when i had training at like 5:30 or 6:30 and he would be the one to drive me there um yeah. It's really a, a giant team effort, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of team effort, so I saw this interview of your parents in the Straits Times, and your parents are so incredibly proud of you when you won the bronze medal at uh, at the Rio Paralympic Games. They said the, you winning the bronze medal felt like a goal to them, and um, and I think you know they're so supportive. And and what I really liked was something they said, you know that. Every child, able or disabled, has their own unique strength. And for an able um, child, sports would help them, and more so for a a child with a disability, because sports, you know, brings people together. Sports um, gives you the opportunity to make friends, to meet people, to work towards a goal. Right? I think that also resonates with with this series, which is why you know, thank you so much for coming on the series. Um, so this series, Secrets to Success, is basically to tell the story and journeys of people who become successful through sheer hard work, determination, and and I'm a believer that you know, every every one of us on earth have our own unique. Strengths, our own unique abilities, and no two paths are the same. You know, all of us have our own journeys that we're on, and I'm ho- hoping to use you know this platform to tell the stories of other people like yourself and other people that have come on the show to inspire others that every one of us have our own unique strengths. Um, as your parents have said, also, and that we are all on our own journeys and able to achieve success in different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, they just what they said that is is. Um, pretty much a summary of how they brought me up, you know. Yeah. Um, when I'm mean, growing up, they really, I I believe disability in a lot of times is based mm. on the environment you are in. Mm. So like, um, if let's say, for example, uh, okay, if example, the world now was built with uh people with disabilities in mind, people with wheelchairs mm. who use wheelchairs in mind. Then it would pretty much kind of almost cancel out disability because everybody can access the same thing, um, and I think that was kind of the mindset that my parents brought me up in. You know, um, yeah. and at home they made sure that uh, things like switches were on my level, um, mm. anything that I needed to access was on my level. It was so kind of to make sure that I didn't need to ask for help, um, and I could be independent. You know, I think they they instilled that. In me, and I think um, it really helped to build that mindset for me to to make sure that I know 
if I want to do something and it's it's doable or you know if even if it's not doable you find a way around it you know um yeah. but that's not to say that um people don't have responsibilities in other areas to ensure that the world that they create also is accessible for everybody you know um yeah. and I know like when you said when you said that uh we all have our roles to play I I strongly believe in that you know equality is not a one person job it's it's the job of everybody it's um it's you knowing that you have that power it's you knowing you have that um ability it's you knowing that you have that choice to yeah. understand that the world is built for some people in mind and these people maybe find it so much easier to go through life but then what about the others you know i think it's about knowing that you have that opportunity to make it better um yeah, yeah i think trying to kind of uh, make sure that you leave the world better than you came into it. Yeah, is... no, very well said. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, this conversation surrounding disability, which I think will be interesting to go into. Um, mm-hmm. But coming back to your Paralympic uh, journey through swimming, right? And very, very happy to have this discussion about, you know, disability later on in our chat. Um, at the Beijing Games, you narrowly missed out on the bronze medal by 0.7 seconds. Not even <laughs> one second, like 0.7 seconds. <laughs> Um, how how did that make you feel at that time, and how did you handle that, and what made you come back even stronger at Rio? Oh, that was like probably the mo- lowest moment of my my entire swimming career. Um, and recently, um, let me think. Uh, like I don't know what I can say, but recently I I, I rewatched the video of uh, my Beijing race. Okay. Uh, and I had never seen it, you know. Um, okay. From the moment, from that very moment that I finished the race till, mm. um, to to like maybe a month ago, I never watched my race because every time I thought about it, it was just a painful memory, you know. Uh, it mm. was something I did not want to revisit, lah, you know. Um, and and it took me a long time to actually be okay with it. Uh, and I remember the. I remember being really sad for maybe two years after the race, um, and um, I had to I had to step away from the pool, the environment that was making me really really upset, you know, uh, which was the pool. So I I had to step mm-hmm. away from that 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 whole space, and I I went and did something else, you know, just to just to change my environment. So I went into powerlifting okay. for nine months. Um, just to see what what how it is. Um, and I found that I really really enjoyed it. You know, I I enjoy being in the gym. Uh, mm. I like I like lifting weights and you know the stuff kind of stuff. But by the end of nine months, I, I had gone to one competition and I did pretty well. You know, I knew that if I stuck through it, I would probably be able to achieve some form of success. You know, and success. First of all, is is determined determined by yourself. Like, you can only only you can determine how successful you are. You know. Um, and I think for me, I I saw that kind of uh vision of I could kind of somewhat be successful if I keep yeah. going at it, right? But then there was just something like inside of me that was like, but I want to go back to swimming. You know, it's it's just that kind of uh internal feeling of I I'm not done yet. You know. Mm. Uh. So I mean, truly, that was the only reason, lah. You know, um, if you look at it logically, I don't know if it made sense for me to go back to swimming, just because I wasn't doing very well in the pool. Um, it was it was a struggle, lah, to kind of get back to the kind of level that I was before. Um, mm-hmm. so but you did even know. better. You got a bronze. No one saw a that coming, medal. though. <laughs> <laughs> like it was, it was, it was even after that. It, it, I still had another games in between Beijing okay. and Rio. It was London, and even London, like I think London was just part of the process. You know, um, mm-hmm. I made sure that I go, went there and I enjoyed my my games. You know, I wanted to make sure I enjoyed the pool again, enjoyed competing again. I, it was a step. So it's a shift process. in mindset, right? Yeah, it was. It was a shift in mindset. It was a shift in. Um, why I chose to do it. So before, like Beijing, right, was kind of a real struggle. Like I, I, I wasn't really um mentally present. Uh, a lot of the times, it was just go through the motion, just get through with training. It's gonna be like hard work. Uh, but 
but it's going to come down to something. It's going to amount to a, a like success, you know. Um, mm. and then and then come down to it, the the day of the races that I just could not. I, I was I was I choked lah, you know. Uh, I had swum so much better races beforehand, and um, once I once I touched the wall, I just I just knew lah. It was not. It was not gonna be so. I was like, okay, maybe if I don't look at the time, it will magically change to a time that I won. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know that that if you don't, if you don't, that kind of Pandora's box kind of thing. Yeah, is that so the right? You know, no, Shonggi what... Shodinger's cat is that the one? Uh, yeah. So like, yeah, don't look, yeah. don't look, yeah, just don't look. Yeah. So when you in in a race, right? As a swimmer, what mm-hmm. happens when you touch the wall? When do you know what placing you achieve? Is it when you look up at the time score or a board and see your ranking? Is it? Yeah, if you if you don't see someone cheering, then you look lah. <laughs> but um, that's <laughs> pretty much how you know lah. Okay, okay. So so that was Beijing, right? Um, when you when you said it was the lowest moment in your swimming career, then you went on to London and you went on to Rio. And how did you feel when you won a bronze medal at Rio? It was. What What do you remember surreal. from that day? Yeah. Um, what do I remember? I don't remember anything. I just remember the. Over like the the feelings lah. I mean, um, I remember, I actually remember more of like how the, how I felt leading up to it. Like it was a lot more happy. I was a mm. lot more um, yeah, I was a lot happier in the in training. Uh, Mm-mm. and I was a lot um more relaxed at training. Um. I was looking forward to racing, which was something that I don't usually or didn't usually feel lah. Um, and and then I remember racing, and and when I finally got the, like, I saw the results, and then yeah. like it kind of was a huge relief off my shoulders, uh. Um, yeah, yeah. and and then I remember also, um, getting out of the pool and hugging my, <laughs> hugging my competitor, um, who who recently retired also. Uh, okay. Yeah, and and she's like she's, she's the one that I've been racing with for ages, uh, and she's always been, um, kind of neck and neck with me. Um, and and I I yeah I I truly truly respect her, and she, like on that day of my race, she actually told me this is your time, and I was like, ah, how do you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, <I'm joking. laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. Uh. I think I, I was really really pleased for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that you have you retired last day in swimming, so you swam from nineteen ninety nine to two thousand nineteen. What did you learn about yourself through this, you know, twenty years swimming career? Um, what did I learn about myself? Uh, I learned that I do things better when I'm happy. Um, so yeah, I I mean it just makes it more worthwhile for me. Um, I think it's more worthwhile. It's more fulfilling. It's more, uh, the way I I want to live my life, lah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But um, and I also am very grateful for a lot of like everything that I went through, lah. You know, I I definitely don't regret any anything at all. Um, the hardships, the high points, low points, I I I take it all. You know, I do not want to leave anything behind because. It has led to me being here, like yeah. now. Everything in its entirety, right? Yeah, and 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 it's led to me being the person I am, um, and I like the person I am, you know, and I I don't want to change that. So I think something I've learned is to no matter how bad things get for me, I know that there's something better to look forward to. Oh, I um, love that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I. I I think another like maybe not quite related lah, but I think I I am very keen on how things can lead to greater things. Like I think, wow, that's such a big thing to say. But like, <laughs> I say like, I I just know that everything that I've there done are bigger is things that leading. Happen. Yeah, it's leading to greater things, and I think I I am very happy with life like right now yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm I'm very keen on doing better la, and helping to make things in the world better 
Yeah, I, I mean, I admire the way you think, um, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic. It's been a tough time for a lot of people, a lot of businesses and a lot of families. Mm. It's about having that belief that even when things are low, even when things are not going well, that there are better things lying ahead. Mm. Something that I tell um, someone that I know who went through a very tough time is that like, you know, when things go down, 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 they can only come up at some point, right? I mean, how low can they go? When they go really down, they have to come up at some point. Well, so. Sometimes you go down until there's no more. <laughs> <laughs> Rock bottom. And then Rock you have to come up, right? So mm, Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely am... Like, it's, it's a very balanced thing for me. So, like, I, I'm a huge believer in, like, balance. So, I know that there's only... Like, there's, there's positive mindset. But there's also, mm-hmm. on the other hand, when you are going through that up, right? then thinking about the people who are going through the down, you know, yeah. I think it's also important because like, it's, a, it's really a seesaw thing, like, you know, don't don't just uh, think that um, everybody can kind of go through the ups as you can. Uh, some people really need your help to go through the up, yeah. you know. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and um, talking about conversation about disability, some people see someone with a person with a disability and for example if you come across someone who's at the train station who's struggling to get up the stairs you know some people look at a person with a disability and they may feel empathy for that person and they feel compassionate and out of the kindness of their heart you know they feel like they need to reach out to that person and feel like they, sh- they should help how do you feel about society's response about this and what would you prefer them to view differently of differently able people I think I think it's a very human thing to kind of look at someone who is more visibly struggling and want to reach out to help. But I yeah. think also it's about reframing how you view struggle. Um, whether it's such a complicated thing also because I think it's so many variables, right? Um, so if personally for me, if I was going up a, a ramp, uh, if I would personally not like anyone to help me because mm. I know that even though I look like I'm struggling, I'm okay. <laughs> I can, I will make my way up and I will make it up there somehow. <laughs> um, it's different if I'm falling. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, like if I'm falling and there's a real danger, yeah, I'm going to hurt myself, you know, then please help me, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if, if like, I think... It's, it's how I think people generally look at people with disabilities and instantly think that they need help, you know? Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's the problem there. When, when they see, um, like, little things or daily things that we do, we're doing, like, maybe just crossing the street, okay? And, mm. and I'm just crossing the street. It's a, no big deal. But then they instantly think, they, they kind of instantly relate to a chair with... Um, like, I mean, I'm going to be frank, no? Um, wheelchair equals lower, equals more helpless, equals I need to help them. So then, then they, oh, I want to help you go across the street. When actually I need no help going across the street, you know? Like, that's, mm-hmm. I guess that's the, the, the mindset that I would like to change. Um, yeah. Like, if it's a daily activity that I am just doing, like, my own thing, like, I don't, I really basically don't need any help, you know? Then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to help, I, I feel like it's quite standard, lah, you know, if I need help, I'll ask for help. Um, mm. If I am, if, let's say I'm, I don't know what kind of examples I can give you. If I'm at the bus stop and I am, uh, hurt my shoulder and I'm like, I cannot go up the bus, then I will ask for help. I'll be like, hi, can you uh, push me up the bus, bus please? Mm. I, don't know, I, I can't move my arm or something like that, you know? Um, it, it's a two-way thing, lah, you know, I, I feel like people sh- in, it's more harmful if people automatically assume that I will need help just because I'm on a wheelchair. But it's also yeah. harmful if I don't dare to ask for help. You know? um, yeah. But even asking for help is a thing. La. I think for me, I definitely struggle with asking for help. I'm um, very prone to just kind of bashing my way through and doing it on my own. Because I'm stubborn that way. But like, I, I think that's also a little bit of... Um, um, that is beauty in asking for help. La. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if beauty is the right word. Uh, the words are not coming to me today. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I completely understand what you're saying. If you wonder if they need help, you can ask them, you know. I, I know yeah. uh, going up a ramp can look hard and it's not easy, I can tell you that. But 
um, if like people have asked me before, like, hey, do you need help? And if I say no, then they, they you know, they go away, lah, you know, which is, is yeah. fine. But if, I think there's also another problem where, where they, they assume you need help and then when you say you don't need help, they, they say you need help, you know. And then, <laughs> like, I don't so trust, trust what a you know, person, a different uh, person says when you ask them if they need help. It's very exasperating, lah. Yeah, when they, when they say you need help even though I say I don't need help, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very, it lowers, like it lowers me to a different level, lah, which when, when people mm. do that. Yeah. I read about this term called super crip. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like the opposite um, end of the spectrum, lah. Okay. Yeah. Tell us more about what that means. Okay. Um, based on my very layman understanding, uh, I think uh, super creep means like from the other. Also, from one as and one extreme is like when you look at a person with disability and you ultimately think that they cannot do everything and anything, and then the other spectrum is like you look at the at them and you view everything that they do as amazing. So like. Um. Well, like it's it's just a, a whole other like <laughs> level. Um. For example, if a person who doesn't have arms and they are driving with their feet, mm. okay, then people are like, "Wow, amazing, amazing, so inspiring." And don't don't get me wrong. I understand where people are coming from. I get yeah. why you see it as inspiring. But I also want you to be able to sit and understand and. And get why this is problematic, <laughs> because mm. this is their normal. Having no arms is their normal. They're driving. Everybody, pretty much everybody can drive. Yeah. Um, the only reason why you think it's amazing is because you're not familiar with it. It's not something that's your normal, you know. Mm-hmm. And and that's not to say that they are not normal, you know. It's just that you have a different reality from them, lah. You know, and you have a different upbringing, you have a different life, you have different lived experience. And I think when you, when you just kind of live everything that they do as amazing, it really inhibits it, it them from the being... It achieves the opposite effect. It does. And it I'm really saying. inhibits their ability to live life as they want, which is normally, mm-hmm. like, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it, 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 it has a very harmful stereotype. And then it also sets a very bad precedence for um, other disabled people, like, you know. It's all a learning, learning in process, lah. Even I am learning every day, uh, every time. Um, I used to think that I don't want to be called disabled, just because I thought disabled was a dirty word, you know. Um, and it took learning to understand. There's nothing wrong with disabled, you know. Uh, I I embrace being called disabled. You can call me disabled. By all means, call me disabled. You know, I think it's 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 just about reframing your mindset and knowing why you feel uncomfortable with certain things, why you are more okay with certain things, why why are people more okay with uh, people automatically like they were. If you want to help someone on a wheelchair, how come people are more like, I had they have good intentions one. You know, how come you don't think about it from the person with disabilities point of view? You know, we, mm. like you have to kind of. It's hard being human being these days, <laughs> but like it, but it, it is it, a bit tricky because it's like you know I mean if you see someone kind of like looking like they need help, I think like humans' natural reaction or response is to like oh you know go and help because you feel compassionate for them right. But at the same yeah. time, if you kind of insist that they need help, then yeah. like you said, you know it's from a um, from a person with a disability's point of view, it mm. may come across as like why are you trying so hard to help? <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with the way I'm doing it? You know, um, mm. I think you have to also understand what our actions are speak in. Where where was it born from? Yeah. Why do we do this? Why do we feel like this? And I think there's no shame in understanding that we can change or need to yeah. change. You know, there's ultimately it's just that desire to grow, desire to be better, and I think, honestly, even just personally speaking, I just want to be treated as equal, uh, you know, and um, that that is many, 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 many uh, things to look at. Many, like, it's, it's so deeply rooted in society yeah. that, that it's hard to change, uh, you know, but that's not to say we can't. We're slowly making progress. I think um, there, was, there was a time where I felt like nobody would listen when I said I didn't need help up the uh, ramp, but then like recently, I've I've been thinking about it, and people are way more um respectful, way more uh aware of what they're doing. You know, when they when they ask me if I need help, I say, oh no, thank you. Then they're like, okay, bye bye. You know, that kind of <laughs> it's not it's not an yeah. offensive thing. You know, I understand yeah. good intentions, but I think 
as the that's I I actually weirdly enough prefer if people just ignore me. Do you think that this is something that is that you feel that way, or do you think that's also representative of uh, most people with with disabilities? I honestly don't know. I should ask. Um, but I think it's uh, I mean it's not hard to understand lah. You know when yeah yeah when I think I've I've lived to like lived to be able to experience so many times when people like knowing that people automatically look at you and think you need help. Then like right now my first response whenever I am for example when I am uh when I have to go up a ramp, I will yeah. actually make sure that there's no one around me before I go up the ramp. Because I don't want the opportunity to come out where they ask if I need help. Right. Like it's it's gotten to that point where I I become like averse to help. <laughs> right. Just right. because and and it could be because of my own ego or stubbornness, but it's also the fact that people just can't stop thinking that a person on a wheelchair needs help. <laughs> mm. You know, and I think we all gotta understand that. Yeah. yeah so not overdoing it as well, lah. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's interesting just now you mentioned about terms, you know, and I think as society, we play also a very important role in shaping the mindset and, you know, framing the mind on how we view people with a disability. So, for example, mm. like, you know, I mean, this is very rare, of course, but I mean, there are, you know, very few people who sometimes refer to people who are mentally challenged or someone with a mm. mental disability as, oh, crazy or stupid or retarded, yeah. right? And yeah. And I think it's refraining from using terms like that and even terms like, um, handicapped or crippled mm, or mm, or disabled, you know, maybe yeah. people should avoid using these kind of terms, but use terms like differently abled or mm, a person mm. with a disability. Mm, um, mm. What, what are your I thoughts definitely, on that? Um, definitely also a learning pro- in progress. Um, I think as we become more aware of things, aware of people's uh, feelings and emotions and, and how and stuff like that, you know, I think mm. it's all, um, we, we grow in the times, lah. you know, there was a time when I still remember people would use gay in a, in a, a bad light, you know, and yeah. now we've come to a point where it's not, you know, or, or at least not socially acceptable anymore. Uh, I don't think, <laughs> um, and and I at, at the point when I was still experiencing where people were using gay in a bad I, in a, as a dirty word, you know, I didn't think that it would get to this point, you know, mm-hmm. and and so it's it's really a lot of hard work and and um changing the way you use language, you know, uh, and because language is so um common and we use it daily and we use it casually and flippantly like, and we don't really think about it that much right I think yeah. that is also where there's a danger in it like, because it's like oh, yeah it's nothing like it's just a word right um but then but it for is me, important right yeah yeah it, it frames it frames also it's all about framing mindsets right I think uh when you call somebody crippled what what is that what is the um uh, what is the what do you call that? Like, what, like the image the, that you have is yeah, what, what if you, you use that what word. You, yeah. what, what's the implication? What do you imply yeah. from that? Uh, when you call someone... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all about language. And I think even when it comes to language, like we've recently gone into person-first language, like people with disabilities and stuff like that, right? That one's also quite new, I think. Like, I think it's mm. only recent that people have started really adopting person-first language. Um, and then suddenly I read somewhere that... Um, uh, like, and, and I adopt it also like I think when people say why do you want to shy away from the disability when it is part of who you are and I'm like oh, that's true you know it's all about like mm-hmm. kind of listening to different points of views and feeling for yourself what fits for you so for yeah. me personally right I prefer if people call me a disabled swimmer or disabled person because okay. there is that implication or I'm implying that disabled is not a bad word you know, mm, and I, yeah. I truly believe that, you know, so it's, it's, it depends on you, I feel like it's very personal, right, because some people, yeah. hi Kirsten, uh, some people, uh, I know some disabled people who do not want to be called disabled, and that's really up to them, it's very personal, um, yeah. but for me, I, I prefer it, I encourage it, um, but I also think for like, kind of general purposes, yeah. uh, personal yeah. disability is, the, is, is definitely more acceptable, la. Um, yeah. it's more okay. it's more socially acceptable. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks for thanks for enlightening us and educating yeah. us about this topic. I mean it's yeah. great to, you know, 
um, learn more. I'm also learning from listening to what you're saying and being educated on inclusion, on on um, people or persons with disabilities. So in terms of Singapore, right, how would you rate Singapore as a city, as a wheelchair user? Um, you've also gone around the world competing in different cities and, you know, you, you've had to go around the cities as well. How does Singapore rank compared to the other cities in terms of uh, accessibility, etc.? Mm. I don't remember what it feels like to go out. <laughs> <laughs> We've been stuck inside for far too long. I don't know, man. Um... <laughs> I think it's not bad. Like I, I definitely feel like I can go pretty much where I want to go. But I also keep in mind that I'm pretty mobile. Um, I can transfer myself from chair to car and, you know, I can keep my own chair in the car. Um, okay. I mean, I'm pretty mobile and I think that's also a factor. Lah. Um, but that's from my own experience. I think it's like at least 7.5, 8. Um... There's still like it's in seven point five eight out of ten, is it? You'd give it a rating. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean it's still it's still like points to deduct from like um not not uh not enough kind of clean, accessible toilets in public. Okay. Um and Are those in certain areas in Singapore or um I generally? think have to like I, have I think to, Singapore I has pretty clean toilets overall, it's, it's right? Okay la, yeah. But I think I also like uh, I I usually have to look out for like malls or stuff like that, like ex- mm. like clean buildings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I don't know. Like I don't. I I think remember when I was in Australia and I was uh going to a national park, like the kind of uh yeah some kind of national park, and the toilets were so clean and accessible, and I I was mm. not expecting that from a national park. So it's a, a public like yeah public access, you know um. Yeah, I think it's 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 so many things, right? It's about whether the public also helps to kind of keep it keep clean. It clean. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So we all yeah. have a part to play. Yeah. yeah, it's about knowing that yeah, Lord, I mean it all still kind of comes come down to everybody knowing that they are part of this uh mm. world. Yeah, don't just leave it leave the mess for uh someone else to take care of. You yeah. you can take care of it, you take care of it, like, you know. Um yeah. but I think like ex- like transport wise it's pretty good. Um um, nightlife could do a lot better with being accessible. <laughs> yeah, yeah but but I, think, yeah, I think the MRT, the train stations uh, in Singapore, they they all have lifts, right? So yes, um, yes. yeah, and then like bus have, buses have ramps. So I think yes. that's yeah. Yeah, I I think as a whole, like it's it's not bad lah. It's not bad. Mm-hmm. The, there's so no apart- perfect place yet lah. Right, right. So apart from, you know, making toilets more accessible and clean, what more do you think can be done to help the problems that differently abled people may face in terms of accessibility uh, in Singapore or elsewhere around the world? Um, again, I think like when we kind of tackle problems like this, yeah. and if you're looking at it like as a, someone who's building a, a, a building or building facilities, um, definitely, kind of keep people that you're use yeah that are going to use this in yeah, the loop. In mind, right? So yeah, I mean, for the people, by the people lah, you know. So, um, like for me, I can only speak from what I need, and I think for me, it's accessible, clean toilets. But then there's also so many different types of disabilities. You know, some people yeah. need a uh, much bigger, see. yeah. Um, they need bigger toilets, or they need um. Um, braille or if they need a uh, voice activated um stuff you know or yeah. if they need yeah I mean there's so many access points to be completely honest so yeah. it's really um kind of uh, asking like, asking what what is required yeah so I think it's building yeah. infrastructure and facilities with people with disabilities in mind right when they mm. build these yeah well, I mean honestly if you think about it when you build facilities for people with disabilities in mind you build for everybody <laughs> Yes, yes. Right, like, it's not like you're leaving anyone out, but if you're building for people who don't have disabilities, then you're definitely leaving a bunch of people out. Um, right, yeah. So, so it's making, I, yeah. increasing the inclusion, inclusion of everybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. And in terms of, like, you know, people with disabilities, what advice would you give them if, say, they want to go for sports and fitness classes, but if they cannot find, you know... um some places that perhaps may not necessarily be designed for individuals with disabilities, what advice would you give to this group of people? If they are looking for 
to to ways to increase their sports and fitness activities. Okay. Um, But if the place does not have, you know, uh, facilities that may necessarily help them or cater to them. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, hmm. I think there's a lot of facilities out there that have mm. um like, access needs, you know. Mm. Uh, I would say if it does not, then don't go there. <laughs> um, but, um, but but I say that I say that with because I I I I can I can do other things lah. Um, yeah. I think looking at it from all points, if you want, if If you want, you can bring it up with the people who you you if you the people who are who are who have who are organizing this uh physical activity, you know, um, and I think just on their point of from their side lah, whether they have uh if they have a choice to make uh to choose an accessible venue, I think I would hope that they will choose that lah. But of course, yeah. there's so many things to think about, right? There's like rental lah, there's like um space, there's like uh, there's just things to think about and I think uh, unfortunately this will sometimes just result in leaving a bunch of people behind yeah. um, I think if you look at um, let's say if you if you are interested in a yoga class okay okay uh, and if you know that the building is accessible but you don't know if they are okay with ex- like uh, accepting people with disabilities Yeah. Then, then you know, there's always that, there's always that fear, lah. To be honest, uh, and mm. so for me, I w- I would ask, uh, if you know, uh, if they they have thought about it, if they are willing to accept, you know, which is which feels very weird yeah. because it's like, are you okay with me? <laughs> um, but ask or I think um another thing that I would definitely encourage is asking questions. Um, that that way you're clear about like communication is key, lah. Right. Uh, yeah. whether you, you you can find out a lot of things. Um, I th- I think it applies to like when when I'm traveling also when I'm yeah. not sure about something I ask. Um, like hotels, if I'm not sure if they have something that I need, like uh, is it flat ground? Is it uh one step? Is it two steps? Is it a high mm. step? You know, I will ask them lah. You know, so that there's yeah. a clearer picture in my mind. You know what to expect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. and yeah, you know, I mean, if you ask. And they don't have uh what you need, then you look for something else, or yeah. Uh, unfortunately, okay. I just don't know lah. I don't know if there's another way to think about it because right now that's my 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 thought process. Or if you ask and they don't have it, you move on. Mm, yeah. yeah. There's there's other ways to tackle it lah. If you want to change things. Mm. And in terms of the media, right? How important do you think, um, the role that the media plays in terms of helping to create awareness around inclusion surrounding disability? Media, media plays a huge yeah. role. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we we consume media every day, right? Yeah. Um, I think we consume media in, in like traditional di- digital digital media or physical, like the the paper and stuff like that. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, everywhere you look, there's media, radio, put podcast, TV. You know, um, and I think it definitely has a way has a huge importance in shaping mindsets. Um. Um, I remember being young and never really seeing anybody on a wheelchair. Um, I remember looking at uh, TV shows and at one point only seeing people on wheelchairs who were pitiful characters or mm. or villains. <laughs> um, and and it was it was it, it shapes your mindset, lah. You know, you you may not be conscious about it, maybe, but then. You it, it still it still shapes the way you think, um, and it's especially still not if you are not stereotyping. Not stereotyping. Yeah, I think. Yes. Yeah, basically, don't stereotype anybody, lah. Yes. <laughs> uh, no matter what kind of label, um, and I think you can see a lot more of that in, um, recent times, um, stereotypes and how that uh is harmful to people, lah. You know. Um, yeah. So I think. Again, it really boils down to knowing you have a role to play, <laughs> yes. play your role well, right? Like if you are in media, you know you have that power. Do something about it. Uh, don't yeah. just kind of uh, subscribe to the norms and and stereotypes and be like ah, that's what it's, how it's always been done. So let's just do that. You know, uh, mm-hmm. I think if you have the power to change things, you should move towards that, lah. Yeah, 
Yeah, and speaking of role and power, right? Um, I think you have a great what you've done is great. You know, um, using your strengths in swimming and being a Paralympian, winning bronze medals and gold medals at the ASEAN Para Games. How do you use your voice to raise awareness about disabilities and to further educate um, society about disabilities, inclusion, and accessibility? Um. I mean, I, I try to do it in every way I can, I guess. Um, whether it's uh, the simplest way is through my social media. Um, kind of embodying what I want to put out every day. Uh, yes. I think that that's how I do it. I, I really am. I'm still also still figuring out. Uh, um, there are bigger, bigger kind of ways I can do, I can change the way... Um, the world is maybe, but yeah. I I still haven't really gone there yet, lah. There's uh, I guess through daily conversations, through things like this, um, through communicating with uh, strangers, communicating with um friends, or um yeah, I mean there's so many venue uh, avenues to take. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, using your voice and the platform that you have and doing yeah. and having conversations, you know, to, and, and, to yeah, yeah, and awareness I do like, about this topic. Yeah. I do like, like, this kind of, like, putting stories out because I think people enjoy stories and mm-hmm. um, one way you know about the world is if you cannot travel, bring the, bring the travel to you, lah, you know, so you bring people's stories to you even if you may not be able to be in the same space. Um, yeah. I think being able to kind of understand... How people are how how people are living, what people are going through, just by listening to how they live, you know. I think yeah, it's, it's also helpful, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. Really, I've learned a lot about uh, about your journey as a Paralympian. You know, all the obstacles that you faced and how you felt after the Beijing or, uh, Paralympics, and then uh, your journey to London and Rio after that. I think it's um it's very encouraging to listen to your story and also um your sharing about how what we society can do to help or rather, you know, um, not as in like <laughs> literally help, like you said, so not necessarily <laughs> help all the time. Sometimes. But yes, you know, helping in different ways, whether it's yeah. knowing when to step in, knowing when to step back um, mm-hmm. at the appropriate times. And also, yeah, I think I've learned a lot. Thank you for educating me and also the rest of our viewers who are tuning in. And of course, you know, thank you so much to all of you guys who took time out of your Friday evening to join us today, um, to join Teresa and myself, and uh, of course, Teresa, thank you so much for, for joining us today and sharing your story, <laughs> your journey, and uh, of course, uh, educating us and teaching us about, um, about different perspectives and about the topics surrounding uh, disabilities and inclusion. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you Everybody so much for joining. Have a great weekend. <laughs> you too. Have a good weekend. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Teresa.